These are Joe Rogan experience moments that will blow your mind. From conspiracy theories to life lessons, this video has it all. And as always, if you guys enjoy, don't forget to press that subscribe button. No, today uh, we have come to this place where uh, if you want to be peaceful, you need a chemical. Yeah. You want to be joyful, you need a chemical. You want to be healthful, you need a chemical. Well, you want to be ecstatic, of course, there is a chemical. Right. So, what is the consequence of this? Why this is happening? One thing is in this generation, one thing that's happened in people's minds is, the heaven has collapsed in people's minds. The heaven? Yes. How so? See, uh, I've been talking to people, fifty years ago if I spoke to people, and uh, I asked how many of you want to go to heaven, almost eighty percent would raise their hands. Today you go to your university and ask them, how many of you want to go to heaven? They'll say, <laughs> they think it's a ridiculous question, all right? Nobody mm -hmm. will raise their hand. So in their minds, heaven has collapsed, there's no place to go. So they want to do it everything here, mm, all right? I see. So they have not found how to be joyful and ecstatic within themselves. So chemical usage, initially it became alcohol, then it became chemicals, it's getting stronger and stronger. And... Uh, you know, so many people dying of those things every every day and illnesses and it's costing a nation and the world a lot. It's not just in one country, it's it's going across the world. Law enforcement agencies may be controlling it a little bit, but they can never control it totally because the consumption is mass-based. It is uh, more people <laughs> maybe <laughs> consuming yeah. these things than people eating bread. <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming like that. Is so, this whole movement, where it's going means, if you do not raise human consciousness, if you do not teach people how to sit here feeling absolutely blissed out within yourself by your own nature, because this human mechanism is the most sophisticated chemical factory. If you are a good CEO, you would produce the chemicals that will give you fantastic experience. If you're a lousy CEO, you're giving yourself a bad experience. Yes. Now you're buying chemicals from outside to fix that, all right? So essentially you're a bad manager of your own system. You're not taking charge of this. Why has that happened? Because your education, your society is talking about conquering the world, but never taught you anything about how to take charge of this. Do you agree with yes. me? Yes. The most are in this room, there's so much technology here. In this room, the most complex and sophisticated technology is within your system. Yes or no? Human system. Yes. This is. Have you read the user's manual? There's no user's manual. There is. There is? Yes. Where is it It's at? built into the machine. <laughs> oh, how do I get it? <laughs> you need to pay attention. You're reading inner engineering. <laughs> Read that carefully. There are. I'm reading it. I'm in the middle. <laughs> I'm at part two. There are uh, pointers as to how to read your own user's manual. Yes. Let me take you back to this concept of heaven. You know, when you're talking about uh, people in universities that you say how many of them want to go to heaven, the problem is they don't have any evidence of heaven. And so when a lot of these young people that are atheists or agnostics, they don't want to buy into anything that they believe is connected to fairy tales or they're connected to some sort of an ideology that they believe was manufactured to control people and to keep people That's in check. That's what I said. The heaven has yes. collapsed in their minds. In their minds. But yep. it's also because heaven is connected to religion and religion is connected to atrocities. There's a lot of people that think of religion. They think of the, the evils of the <laughs> Catholic Church or they think of you know, what religion has justified, the, the horrors of history, the things that people have done in the name of religion. So a lot of younger, sophisticated, intelligent people don't want to believe in anything that there's no evidence for. So when you say, how many of them want to go to heaven, say, show me a video. Tell me where I'm going. Do you have a map <laughs> no, of heaven? I'm not asking that question, offering a ticket. I'm just telling you, heaven has collapsed in people's mind, which is a good thing because... It's a good thing? It is because because the idea that this is not the place to live well, right. there is another place where you will live right. well, I is see. a wrong idea. Right. This is the place to live well. You can have heaven right here. Yes. And uh, who told you you're not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? Um, no one. 
<laughs> I think that's possible. <laughs> we are in a heaven making a mess out of it. We also so could right be in now, hell too, right? Whether we want to fix the soil or we want to fix the human mind, Stop we are war. only trying to see that you don't mess up the heaven in which we have landed. Believe it or not, I'm not into UFOs. I don't follow stories or, you know. Even listen. after your experiences? No, I'm fascinated with the technology and I, I it really it irks me like every night I go to sleep that, you know, I don't that it was my own doing essentially that that prevented me from continuing on in the in the project i mean it's the that to be on that cutting edge of technology is so alluring to me right but you know uh, by the same token i don't really care that there's aliens or where they come from i mean the prize is the technology and that's what i'm fascinated by but so i don't listen to ufo stories and that sort of thing but george knapp is um i mean he's the guy that has the contacts and tries to thread everything together. And uh, what he recently told me is he found, I don't know, it was either documentation or people that he spoke to, it's that this, the existence of this project, the project that I was on, it's something that they seem to take out every eight or 10 years. So that's a very specific memo. And this is actually, I, this is the first time I'll be very clear with people about it. It's a big topic of conversation right now. It's called the Wilson Memo. You can look it up. Admiral Wilson met with a scientist who's actually was featured in one of my films. Everybody has been debating whether or not this document of a conversation with a with an sitting admiral at the time is a real document. It, it's an actual conversation that happened, and this document is real. Everybody wants to know the world is going crazy right now in the UFO world. I'll tell you straight up right now, I'm in the position to know, and it is a real document that it is real. So the conversation you read in that, that conversation was had. I can't attest to every... I don't, but you're not being very clear. Sure. Like, please. Like, no problem. So it, there was a document that is circulating right now that is really big. It's going around everywhere. People are asking and What is this document? It's called the Wilson Memo is what, how you can find it online. The, or the Wilson Leak. There it is. Jimmy's got it. The Wilson Memorandum. Use uh, of human volunteers. No, 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 no. Sure that was it, yeah. No, that's no, not okay, it. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So uh, Admiral Wilson meets with this scientist and they have this discussion, oddly enough, at special projects at EG&G. &G. And I, if I remember, the document is from 2001. I'm telling everybody right now, it's real. And we'll see, my history is pretty good with like saying if something's real or not, right? So here we go. The document comes out. They meet at EG&G &G special projects. In 1989, they, they stumble into a problem. This happens, they put the technology away and then they bring it back out and see if material science has caught up and if they can make any progress. So this document kind of talks about this process. The big thing I get from it, and a lot of it's vindicating to Bob, and one of the things it's vindicating besides the eg &G thing is that private industry, so this guy's an admiral, and he says, I, sh I found out about your SAP, your special access program. I need to know about it. And he's going to a, a, a private part of industry and he is denied access. And he says, I, you know, I should be running this program. And they were able to deny him access. So I think the takeaway here is, check it out. I'm telling you that that is an actual correct, that is a leak. Now, everything said in that document, I'm, I don't know. What are you talking about? What, what is said in that document specifically? It's, it's uh, between a scientist and, and an admiral that are sitting and they're having a, a meeting and they're talking about um, the, the search for the, the UFO subject, the search to get special access program access to all of these different things like reverse engineering programs. So in this document, they talk about it. Uh, I believe that... The, this document, the, the person that went was employed by Robert Bigelow, you know, one of the guys that has a couple of yes. orbiting satellites and all that stuff. Who's he's been, the guy who owns Skinwalker Ranch. No, he's no. not. He was the guy that owns Skinwalker. Own okay. Yeah, he used to own it. There's a new owner, and I, he, I interview him for my other film, but there's a new owner, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that soon. But, uh, like, it'll just, there's, there's stuff that you'll be hearing about Skinwalker Ranch soon because there's a new owner. Anyway, the, the whole point of this in, you know, insertion here is just that that document kind of validates a lot of this idea Bob just said, that they make a little progress, then they can't go anywhere. They tuck it away, and then they bring it back out you know, 10 years later and start working on it. What is the limiting factor? I think Bob should speak on this, but it's the material science. You yeah, know, it's really where physics is, so I, I, can, I can see them doing that. I mean, I didn't have any... Uh, 
information on that, but I think what, you know, George uncovered is probably accurate that, uh, you know, we try and do what we can. And once we reach a roadblock on, we really can't figure it out. It's just friggin' wait, put the thing away, wait for science to catch up. And, you know, a decade later, let's take the project out again and see, all right, now where can we go? But, but there's got to be someone who remains informed, right? Oh, like, yeah. So you've got your scientists like you and Barry. You got your people that you compartmentalize. You got these people working. Yeah, this there project. has to be some people right. that know everything. You've got security, and then someone's going to be on the outside saying, "Hey, we need people to guard this building. Don't let anybody in for ten years." I think. Yeah, I think a lot of that is private industry, and I think that's how really? they keep it. Yeah, I think that's how they litter because the government is just so leaky. I think that's kind of what they're doing. That's what the document kind of proves. You just articulated that that um, it is in control of private industry. What private yeah. industry? Some aerospace company, something. I don't know. Yeah, they wouldn't. They would. The guy, the admiral, wouldn't name it in the car right. in the conversation. Right. Yeah. So they still have these things supposedly i would guess i mean i don't have any information on have you all. ever asked anyone that has any inkling of any idea of where they got them or how they got them no but um something must have been said to me um from barry and but i i it was just too long ago and i i can't quite remember what was said but it it just left a seed in my mind. I think at least one of them was part of an archaeological dig. So it's old. Something one At least one of them is old. I don't know if it was the one I worked on, but I remember something to do with an archaeological dig. Whoa. So that's... Uh, that means it's not just old, it's ancient. Some happy little place where, you know, someone's feeding you peeled grapes. That isn't what it is. It's, it's more like... It's my, more like victory on the honorable battlefield or something like that. Yeah, the, the perception that people have of ultimate success and ultimate happiness is, uh, it seems motivated by what they don't have rather than an understanding of what success and happiness really is. Their, their idea is that one day I'm going to go and I'm going to be in my golden years and I'm just going to be able to sit around and do mm. nothing and tell everybody to fuck off. <laughs> You won't be well, happy I at all. A, yeah, I talked to, to, to one of the people that I was working with who had a, like a vision for retirement. I said, well, what's your vision for retirement? Well, I see myself in the beach, you know, some tropical country drinking margaritas. And I thought, oh, first, that's not a plan. That's a travel <laughs> poster. It's like, okay, let's, let's walk through this. All right, so you go down to this tropical country and you go sit on the beach and you have a margarita. It's like, okay, well, how many margaritas? Like 10? <laughs> okay, so you're going to do that, what, you're going to do that for six months? You'll be dead. Yeah, well, you'll be this, like, pathetic, sunburned, like... Fat. Yeah, yeah. unhappy, yeah. hungover, cirrhotic. In pain. Yeah, yeah, it's like, that's Dehydrated. your vision. Dehydrated. So uh, how long can you have a margarita on a beach? Like, maybe you can do that once every six months for, like, ten minutes, something like that. <laughs> it's not a vision. It's true, but when you are working and slaving away, you think about that beach with your feet up, yeah. and, and the waiter comes over. Would you like another margarita, Mr. Peterson? Yeah. Yes, I would. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, absolutely. all right, but baby. It, right, exactly. But it's it's like this 16-year-old fantasy of yes. paradise. It's like, well, yes. and it just doesn't work out. So yeah. And and the thing that the thing is is that the thing that sustains people through life really is the lifting of a worthwhile burden. It's something like that. Yeah. And it's partly because we're social animals, right? It's like we're evolved to be useful to the people around us because they're much more likely to let us live if we're like that. Yes. So, and, and it's been very fun talking to, especially talking to young men about this. It's like, well, and that's the other thing too, is I think the world, the world is full of darkness, let's say. And we could say each of us have a little bit of light. And if we release that light, if we let it shine properly, Christ, it's too cliched to go on with in some sense, but the world is a lesser place if you do not reveal from within yourself what you have to reveal. And the fact that the world is a lesser place actually turns out not to be trivial. Like, if you aren't everything you could be, more people will die, more people will suffer, more evil will be unconstrained, more tyranny will reign, more chaos will remain chaotic and dangerous all of that do you mean this by this in the sense of like the old proverb of the wings of a butterfly fluttering become a hurricane it's 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 something similar to that but it can even be more local it's like your family 
is more messed up than it could be if you were less messed up than you are. Right. So if you just got your act together, like 10% more, your family would be 1% better. Right. It's like, well, do it. And that would ripple off into that, the well, people uh, that they uh, inter uh, yes. interact yes. with. Yes, and, and, it ripple, and it ripples fast. Yes. That's the other thing that's so cool is that, like, people think, well, there's 7 billion of us. And each of us is just this separate dust moat, like floating in the cosmos. And what the hell difference does it make what you do anyways? It's like, that is not how we're connected. It's like, you're the center of a network. And you know, well, you know way more people than this. But let's say, typically, you know a you're going to know a thousand people in your life. Well enough to have an impact on them. Okay. And each of those thousand people is going to know a thousand people. So you're one step from a million and two steps from a billion. And we are networked, technically. That, that's how human interactions work. And so when you do something that you shouldn't do, it's worse than you think. And when you do something that you should do, it's better than you think. And so you think, well, this is why I've been telling people, well, clean up your room. It's like, well, your room is actually networked too. It's not that easy to clean up your room, to set it. So you want your room to be set up so that when you walk in there, it tells you to be better than you generally are. It's organized. It's got direction. Everything's in its place. You try to do that in a chaotic household. You know, I've watched people do this because I, I had students do these sorts of things as assignments. I'd say, look, pick a small moral goal, clean up your room, and just write down what happens as a consequence. So maybe these are students in a chaotic household. The whole place is a bloody mess. No one's taking any responsibility for anything. And so they decide they're going to start to clean up their room. And then the people in the household notice well, the first thing they do is get pissed off. It's like, who do you think you are? Like, you think you're better than us? You, like, why do you think this is worthwhile? Who made, who died and made you God? All of that. So just by trying to organize this little part of their life, they immediately run into the people whose actions they're casting in a dim light by trying to improve themselves to some degree. They might have to have like a thorough war in their household to be allowed to do something as simple as keep the room orderly. They find out very rapidly that A, that's way more difficult than it sounds, and B, that the consequences of it are far more far-reaching than people think. So that's quite fun. You know, because maybe part of it is, is that like everything around you is full of potential. Everything. Maybe more potential than you could ever possibly utilize. And so maybe all you have is this little rat hole of a room in some rundown place in the world. It's like, fix it up. There's more there than you think. See what happens if you fix it up. And you'll fix yourself up simultaneously because you have to get disciplined in order to fix up the room. And then you have a fixed up room and you'll be a more fixed up person. It's like, you think that nothing will happen as a consequence of that? You know, who are the first people to figure out we're going to die? Right. And, and become aware of our own mortality in a way that, well, maybe I can conceive of being somewhere else. I don't actually die. So we, we know, uh, you know, elephants grieve and mammals grieve and, you know, cetaceans, dolphins, whales and so on. And, and, and chimps, they, you know, they feel you know, these mothers are just just depressed and, and almost suicidal when their infants die. But that's different from, you know, conceiving of like, well, I know I'm going to die because I see people around me going to die, but I conceive of maybe some other place to go. So uh, I start off with something of a paradox that you know, if I ask you to imagine yourself dead, you can't do it because to imagine anything, you have to be alive. So it's not going to be like falling asleep and waking up the next morning because you have dreams or whatever. It's going to be more like general anesthesia where it's, you know, 10, 9, 8, boom, boom, lights out. And you, and, but you just never wake up. So, and, we, and so we talk about things like, well, there's nothing after death. But, but even the word no thing implies there's a thing. Or, you know, you're going to this place, this another, there's, there's nothing. Well, no thing or nowhere, it implies that there's a where that you're not going to, but there's not even a where that you're not going to. And it's like, you know, with Lawrence Krauss and some of these cosmologists, you know, what was there before the Big Bang? So when you say, well, imagine no universe, you know, no stars or planets or galaxies, no light, but, but there's not even any space or time. And at some point, you just, we don't have the words to even say what it is we're trying to talk about. There's, there's nothing before the Big Bang. You can't even actually talk about it. Well, don't they think now, though, that it's impo it's entirely possible that the Big Bang is like a cycle? Yes. That, well, I think that yeah. it's something like that. I think it expands and contracts infinitely forever. Yeah, that that's a preferable. Th well, again, we have to come up with some way to talk about it. So. Don't we also have this weird biological 
idea based on our own limitations that there's a birth and a death of everything. Right. So I actually have a chapter devoted to Deepak Chopra and the Eastern oh, Wisdom my Traditions. Friend. <laughs> I, uh, we're, we're kind of buddies now. And, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. I went to his center down in Carlsbad and spent some time there. And you think he's all right? He's a good guy. Yeah. No, he's totally a good guy. I mean, he's, he, he, he's been and at times in the past uh, either misleading or misled. Yes, sometimes that's right. Um, you know, some of his recommendations for dietary things or whatever, perhaps. But I know for sure, because I've gotten to know him pretty well, that he totally believes the stuff he says. Uh, it sounds like woo-woo, as I used to call it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but a lot of it, if you interpret it from a, a kind of a Buddhist, Western Buddhist position, you know, when he says, uh, you know, consciousness is the ground of all being, it's the ontological primitive, these things that sound nonsensical. Um, but if you think about it, um, it's sort of a, from a simple perspective, the, the entire universe is in your brain. And when you cease to exist, the universe ceases to exist for you. But you're in your brain. Mm. Okay, now, I, I call that the weak consciousness principle. It's just sort of true by definition. Now, he goes a little bit further and says, you know, that consciousness is everything and that we bring into existence material stuff by thinking about or observing it or whatever. And here's some quantum physics experiments that are really spooky. And it's like, okay, time out. You know, quantum physics is weird and spooky. Consciousness is weird and spooky. That doesn't mean they're connected. No, he thinks they are. So it's a debatable point, okay? Uh, but still, um, the the experience of going and, and so we I did the meditation thing and all the massages and the teas and the food and all that stuff and it's you know it's this beachside resort in Carlsbad you can't help but feeling better like yeah this stuff works <laughs> where where is Carlsbad it's down by Encinitas north oh, okay. of San Diego oh okay yeah. that's a beautiful area a totally beautiful yeah he's kind of <laughs> Deepak's not done and he's got a good thing going. <laughs> Uh, so, and not just Deepak, you know, there's other people like Sam Harris. Uh, Bob Wright has a new book out called Why Buddhism is True. Uh, okay, so it works. So we're back to does it work? What do you mean by does it work? Not just for me. I had an experience and I felt better. We got to do better than that for science. So what Deepak and Bob Wright are talking about is that is that the Western version of Buddhism may actually work medically. It may, you know, lower stress hormones in your body, lower blood pressure, these kinds of things that are measurable, because that's what we want to know from a Western scientific perspective, not just do I feel better, but 67% of the people who did this particular treatment, they got better by these measurable criteria. Okay, that's that seems fair enough to me. I'm open to that. Hmm. Now, this idea that there's nothing or no thing that we can't even we can't even wrap our head around nothing because we would think of a thing that right. there's no thing but there's never a thing right right <laughs> but how do we or why why don't we just say we don't know why don't we speculate on the possibility of consciousness being some sort of ethereal thing or something that exists outside of the Bible. We don't know. We really don't know. That's what right? I say. I, I conclude, in, you know, that I don't know if yeah. there's an afterlife or not. In the, at the very end of the book, we can come back to this later, I just say, it doesn't really matter whether there's an afterlife or not, because we don't live in the afterlife. We live in this life. Mm. So this is the time you got to do whatever you got to do. I call this Alvy's error. Uh, Alvy is Alvy Singer, Woody Allen's character in Annie Hall. Uh -huh. Remember the scene early in the movie where he has a flashback as a young boy, and is, he's in this psychiatrist's office with his mom and you know what's the problem he won't do his homework you won't do your homework why won't you do your homework Alvin? he says the universe is expanding he says the universe is expanding he goes the universe is everything there is and if it's expanding one day it's all going to blow apart so nothing really matters i'm not going to do my homework <laughs> and his mother yells at him what does the universe got to do with this we live in brooklyn brooklyn is not expanding <laughs> so that's my sort of take-home message there. It, we don't live in the afterlife right uh, or, or before the universe or after the none of that matters I mean, it's interesting to talk about, but we live in this life. Yeah. So this is what really counts. They're fascinating things to contemplate, but ultimately, you really, for practicality's sake, you really should be paying attention to life. Doug, I did a, a podcast with Jim Florentine, and I explained to Jim Florentine that what people don't know is that Hudson County, New Jersey, northern New Jersey is the number one place in the country where they have the most UFO sightings. Really? Northern New Jersey. Look it up, Jamie, if you get a minute, please, not to be rude. But isn't that like near a couple airports? No. It's closer to, like, the, you know, like when you live in New York City on, and you look at the Hudson River? Mm -hmm. They say that people go on their balcony, they're drinking coffee, they're talking on the phone, and they'll see a little flying saucer go by. Really? 
And I know for a fact that in 1976. A little one? Whatever the fuck they are. I know for a fact that in 1975 and 1976, you could check me out on this. A UFO landed in Hudson County Park. I was a kid, and the next day the feds locked off the park. They had yellow tape. They had what? samples. Go look it up, dog. There's a UFO. There's a. That's you see that 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 that's called the North Bergen is where I'm from. That's called I forget what it's called, but it was so there was it's a circular building. So they did so much coke in there in the eighties. They called it the grinder. That's what they <laughs> called it because it was shaped like the Stonehenge. The Stonehenge. I have a couple friends that lived there. People that lived in that building have seen UFOs for fucking years. And if you go to YouTube, there's an actual North Hudson Park UFO. Wow. They dug up. They even they came out. The mar- there's a liquor store. And the liquor store guy says he's seen the lights. Mm-hmm. You heard, like, the organ music that like they play. They landed. A couple Martians got out and took samples and got back in the thing and took off. There's a YouTube thing. There's a History Channel special about it. And I still remember being a young kid. Did you find anything, Jamie? Not I mean, give. Just, yeah, that that was what's pop, pop, popping up. All that stuff about that building and oh yeah, no, no, no. Is, is there it's anything that says a UFO uh, landed? That that's a, the story I'm reading right now is what he's like saying. Yeah. And witnesses. You know, it's not just one guy that says I know a UFO. It's people who got knocked on the door and said, "Do you did you see anything anything at eleven ten at night?" And they said, "You know what? There were lights flashing outside." They contacted police departments to see if there was any. They went full. Dude. Then the FBI came in, circled the park. Clo- it was by the Little League Field in Hudson County. But it is, a, you know, like you'd think it was Area 51. You'd think it was close to northern Las Vegas. The number one place to see UFOs is northern New Jersey. They even made a reference to it in The Sopranos. <laughs> When he said something, he goes, what are you talking about? Last week you said you seen a UFO in Hackensack. <laughs> because that's where they're at. Hackensack, Moonaki. Right. Throw those, you go to Moonaki, New Jersey. A lot of ugly yeah. people. A lot of people with big heads. The only good thing in <laughs> Moonaki, New Jersey is fucking Segovia, Spanish restaurant. It's been there since 19 fucking Schlemensky. I don't know. But that's the only good thing about Moonaki. I think those people in Moonaki have been abducted. There you go. <laughs> And they put them back as big-headed motherfuckers. I did a gig there. A couple- and I have to say, archaeologists like to insult me by calling me a pseudoscientist. I can't think of anything more pseudoscientific than the Clovis First Doctrine, which locked American archaeology for 50 years in a particular framework, which we now know was totally wrong. Nothing good about it at all. A, com- a complete mistake. What I'm hoping the book will do uh, in the long run is that it will lead to more attention being focused on the Americas. This is a very neglected area of the world uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. I'm, it's, the recent history of the Americas has been relatively well studied, but the deep and ancient history has not been, has not been well studied. And I think America is going to contain revelations for us about our story and about our past. And I'm serious when I, when I suggest that America is the most plausible and the most likely home base for a lost civilization. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. You, need a, you can't have it on a small island. There's got to be a large landmass with enormous resources and the ability for population to grow and for those resources to be, to be mobilized. And what I suddenly realized, you asked earlier why I, why I started to write this book at all, is what the new evidence is pointing to is that the Americas have been wrongly neglected. That here we have a giant continental landmass with extraordinary resources that has just been ruled out of the story of human civilization. But once we take account of the fact that there was a giant cataclysm over North America 12,800 years ago, and once we start looking, as I do in America before, at the incredible deep in-depth similarities between, for example, the religious system of ancient Egypt and the religious system of the Mississippi Valley, then you realize that you're into a, into a global mystery here and that the answer to that mystery may not at all be in the old world and may very much be uh, in, the, in the Americas. See, it's odd. I mentioned Moundville earlier on. It's kind of odd that we should find uh, what is essentially the ancient Egyptian religion uh, manifesting in the symbolism of Moundville, the ascent to Orion that 
transit to the Milky Way, the journey along the Milky Way. Very, these are very specific and, and idiosyncratic ideas. And what makes it doubly odd is Moundville isn't that old. Moundville, as a site, is about a thousand years old. Ancient Egypt had already been gone completely from the world uh, for at least 600 years before Moundville was created. The end of ancient Egypt, there's, there's Moundville. Wow. And uh, w w what we're looking at in the foreground is Mound B, and we're looking at Mound A in the, in the, in the distance, um, and, and a complete circle of mounds. What, what is odd about it is we find this system of ancient Egyptian ideas in Moundville 500 years after ancient Egypt has gone from the world. Uh, the, the, Romans, the, the, the Romans were the end of ancient Egypt. By 400 AD, ancient Egypt is gone. Moundville doesn't even exist then, but 600 years later, it is created and it manifests the entire set of ancient Egyptian ideas. Clearly, it did not get that as a result of direct transmission from ancient Egypt unless they were time travelers. The only way I think it could have got it is as a result of a legacy passed down from a much earlier civilization that had been influenced and affected many different parts of the world. And the characteristics of that civilization, the, the shamanistic heart of it, the use of altered states of consciousness, the focus on those, are amongst the reasons that I would suggest that America is the place that we should be looking. And the big mysteries are in the areas that were so devastated at the end of the last ice age, up in the north of North America, the channeled scablands in particular, and then the Mississippi Valley, the whole story of the Mississippi Valley. Yes, Moundville is a thousand years old, but then you can go back to Poverty Point in Louisiana, which is 2,700 years old. You can go to Watson Break in Louisiana, which is 5,000. 500 years old. You can go to sites like Conley, which are 8,000 years old. The system keeps on going back and disappearing back into time. And I, I think the most fruitful new work on exploring the origins of civilization is going to occur counterintuitively uh, in the Americas, the very last place on earth that archaeologists have ever thought to look. Now, what do you think about these guys that are talking about bringing animals back? Um... Like, as a scientist. Sure. De-extinction is... It's a weird word. It is. It is. It's a weird word. Reintroduction? Is that a better word? No. They call it de-extinction. Is that what they call it? That's what they call it. Yeah. De-extinction is, to me, it's fascinating, especially if it's something like, say, the passenger pigeon, right? We used to have billions of them in the United States. Wiped them out. Um, and now they're saying, you know, we can take the closest living relative... Uh, isolate some genes and make a new passenger pigeon. Is that worth it because it's something we wiped out in the last hundred years? Yes. I feel like that's we should heal the ecosystem by putting that back, right? That being said, we still need to learn from our mistakes. Like, we need to take into account what we did and why we did it. And, like, do I think there should be a Jurassic Park and a bunch of mammoths and T-Rexes? Absolutely not. That's a waste. Whether we can or cannot do it, to me, that's a waste of scientific resources that could go towards conserving things that are on the brink. Now, when you say, like, heal or mend the environment or the ecosystem, when you would bring back something like a pasture pigeon, isn't, like, 90% of everything that ever existed extinct? Sure, absolutely. So does the ecosystem adjust and evolve, and would reintroducing something like a passenger pigeon, would it kind of fuck things up that exist now where new animals have taken a, a different position on the hierarchy? It's too short an evolutionary time. So we are in what's called the sixth mass extinction event, right? There's been five others before us. The one we're in now, it's happening at 80% greater rate than it's ever happened before. So we are wiping out things more quickly than the world can adapt. So, you know, you go into an environment and you take out all the apex predators, the prey explodes. The prey explodes, the grass gets eaten down, everything collapses. Now, if you left that environment over time, over evolutionary time, it would adapt, right? Maybe say, say all of the predators got a disease and they died, o died out over 300 generations. During that time, something would evolve within the environment to adapt the prey so that it didn't wipe out the environment. That's just kind of the nature's balance. But when you go in there and do it in 10 years or five years, it throws off the equilibrium. So when you, in theory, when you reintroduce something that's been, and, and it's not theory, it's, it's science. They've shown this even right here in the California Channel Islands. When you put something back that's missing from the ecosystem, it's like you're putting a piece of the puzzle back, right? And then you can allow it to do its thing over evolutionary time. What did they do in the Channel Islands? So I was actually a big part of that, and I loved, loved the project. So the California Channel Islands were settled by 
agriculture. There were sheep, goats, pigs, blah, blah, blah. There was everything brought over there, right? And so not Catalina, but think about the Northern Channel Islands. Um, what happened was when all these animals were brought in, all the farmers were there, then golden eagles started coming over. Golden eagles came over to eat the pigs and everything else. They oh. flew across the ocean? Yep, flew across oh. the channel, started preying on pigs and everything else. There was an animal on the Channel Islands called the Channel Island Fox, a very gorgeous, cute, cuddly little fox. Um, you can see them if you go to Santa Cruz Island. There's loads of them now, thanks to the work that scientists have done. Anyway, they were like, okay, the, the fox is being... There, there it is. Aww, Isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> look, a little cute face. <laughs> so the fox is being wiped out through habitat destruction through all these undulates that have been brought in. So scientists got together and what, said... What undulates? Like cows? Or? Yeah, yeah, domestic animals. Cows, sheep, goats, etc. So scientists came in and said, you know, the habitat's getting destroyed. The And that that's just the keystone. There were several species that were on the decline. The cows are getting... The, the livestock is wiping out the habitat. The foxes are declining. What do we do? Well... Obvious answer, let's remove all the livestock. So we removed all the livestock, right? Through helicopters, there was a lot of pigs that were causing damage, all that kind of stuff. We removed it all. Then the golden eagle started preying on the foxes because their main habitat was gone. So now the foxes are under even more pressure. So then we removed the golden eagles. This is a very abridged version of what happened. But now we've got the golden eagles also pushed out the bald eagle, which are fish eaters, which lived on the island. So now after loads of years of removing golden eagles, like relocating them, removing all of the livestock, now you have a healthy population of Channel Island foxes. The bald eagles are back. They're eating fish. The whole ecosystem is back in balance. Had it been left the way it was, what you would have found at the California Channel Islands over, say, 20 or 30 more years, 40 or 50 more years, no foxes, no, no bald eagles, a ton of golden eagles, and a ton of pigs. And likely over time, pigs would have exploded to the point that they Easter Islanded themselves, right? They ate up all the resources, destroyed all the habitat, population collapsed, golden eagles collapsed, nothing left on the island. What do you mean by Easter Island themselves? So you're familiar with Easter Island in South America? I know what those statues are and all that stuff, but I, I, I'm not familiar with what happened to the sure. island. So that island is was an ancient civilization that was the Mecca. It had everything off land. It had big trees, tons of food, blah, 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 blah. blah. People settled there. And they said, this place is incredible. It's, it's paradisical. Um, and then they started cutting down the trees to fish. They started eating all the mammals. And what actually happened is because they were so remote, the middle of the ocean, nowhere near South America, nowhere near anywhere else, they cut down the last tree. There were no more canoes. There was no more food on the island. And the population collapsed. The island was barren. It was void of trees, void of life, void of anything. And they, they didn't have the canoes or anything to leave anymore because they cut down the last tree to build, build a boat or make firewood. And everybody there died. Oh, shit. So that, <laughs> that's what happens when you use up every last resource. God. So, wow. When did this happen? I uh, couldn't, couldn't tell you. Because I to... thought it was like a mystery to like what happened to the population of Easter Island. So they, they're pretty that's, sure that's that this That's the happened. accepted, that's the scientifically accepted understanding. And did they get this from fossils? They get this from bones? Mm -hmm. and is that what, So mm -hmm. they, they've sort of pieced it together? Yep. They, took, they take you know, isotope samples and measure carbon dating and, and yada yada. I think the, the heads are still a pretty big mystery. Why? Mm. I think uh, certain people believe that the heads were like uh, an ale, you know, calling to the gods to help save things because they were going so badly, yada yada. But I believe the heads are still a pretty big mystery, but the actual anthropology, the population, the collapse is, is known to be due to uh, running out of resources. How long did it go for? Couldn't how tell long, you. Do, do they have an idea of how long the population lasted? I think it's all. I think it's all published. Yeah, really? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was it was a thriving population that you know flew too close to the sun, as they say. <laughs> so you you like these kind of far out there ideas? How do you like this idea? There's a cut. There's a group of people that say that dragons were real, and I'll explain. Ooh. So. At around the same time period, so to speak, and I'm not one of these people, so I'm probably going to get the details it's wrong like a little bit. Matthew McConaughey movie right yeah, now. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but uh, so around the same time period in, you know, China, South America, Africa, all these different, Rome, all these places, images depicted people fighting dragons, right? And every, every dragon was slightly different, but it was all a giant scaly animal that could fly. So when you, when you break that down, you think about the fact that large birds had a hard time being fossilized because their bones are so porous, right? So because bones, they have like hollowish bones, they break down very easily and they don't fossilize. So the, the, the group that says this, basically they're, they're saying the evidence is the reason there's no fossils of dragons is because they had bird bones and they were actually very delicate animals. But a handful of these small, small, a small population of these giant 
li flying lizards existed and basically encompassed all these different countries where they all depicted fighting dragons in their own way and they were all killed off by you know knights or whatever it is and then didn't fossilize what so it's like the science is saying that if there were lizards big enough to fly around and eat people they it, didn't have bones that could fossilize so it'd be like an eagle right and so and that's why you know that's why all these human populations around the world have depictions of them because they did actually exist now are there any stories of dragons like written like in the times of people that they actually had the written word or is it just depictions i don't know not my field that but, would be interesting because like are these depictions like ancient accounts told by generation after generation like passed down i think so i think i i don't know i don't know anything about dragons or whether right. it's real but i think it's interesting to think oh well the science supports that if there were flying lizards their bones wouldn't have fossilized and these have been passed down stories that have been exaggerated and passed down from generation to generation and some of them breathe fire but some of them don't depending yeah. upon which culture it was yeah. significant to i wonder if what the fire what the fire is supposed to represent or they're just people are full of shit. Probably that one. Yeah, it's probably made it sound even cooler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Not only did I kill him, he was trying to burn me. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that, do you hold any weight? Do you think that holds any weight? Like no, that there was I, actually dragons? I, I, I mean, we know there were large flying lizards during the times of dinosaurs, right? right? The only weight that it could possibly hold is that like a few of those somehow survived much later than we previously thought. But I do I think that there were dragons attacking human beings and civilizations? No, I don't. But Isn't it's still it, interesting. It's so much cooler if there were. Right. And like the fact that we know that pterodactyls did exist, that's cool. Right. It would be way, way cooler as if they existed with people. Right, two thousand years ago. Why yeah. is that? <laughs> Why is that so much cooler to us? I don't know. <laughs> it's like I would be I would I mean, people would dedicate giant chunks of their life trying to find out if pterodactyls did coexist with human beings at oh, one yeah. point in time. They oh, yeah. really would. Absolutely. Imagine if you, there was like a 100-foot pterodactyl snatching kids. It'd be terrifying. Oh, my God. Would well, you know about the uh, the Moa eagle? Yeah. yeah. The host eagle? The host, exactly. Yeah. So I call it Moa eagle because they used to attack Moas. They weren't the that eagle. big. No, but they did supposedly snatch Maori yeah. children. Yeah. yeah. But, but when, when I Googled it, I remember, I think the, the large ones were like 40 pounds or something like that. What are your thoughts on, on alien life, on life outside of this planet? Is I, this something you think about? Yeah, I, I think there must be. Um, even in the solar system, I would not be surprised if we find microbes on Mars or on some of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn where there's liquid water. Like Europa. Yeah. And uh, the reason is, if you think about the reason I think that, and it's a guess, is because if you look at the history of life on Earth, then so Earth formed, and it was just a, it, there was no life, it was a ball of rock. And almost as soon as it cooled down, we see evidence of life. So certainly 3.8 billion years ago, possibly even further back than that, we see evidence of life on Earth. So somewhere along the line, geochemistry, active geochemistry became biochemistry on Earth. And we have some idea, you know, that, that if you get uh, gradients of temperature and acid and alkaline and the conditions that are naturally present on the surface of oceans, then complex carbon chemistry spontaneously happens. So we have a, we know that life, almost certainly we know that life began on Earth. I mean, the, the other option is it came from space or something like that, but it probably didn't, right? it probably began on Earth. Um, so that means that at least here, that happened. And that we know that the conditions that led to the origin of life on Earth were present on Mars 3.8, 4 billion years ago. And we know that they're present on Europa today. So I don't see that there's anything special. Life is just chemistry. And, it, and the, the idea that geochemistry becomes biochemistry is not fanciful because it happened here. So I think that given the same conditions, it would be surprising to me if the same thing didn't happen in that life begins. So I, I, that's one of the, to test that is one of the great frontiers of science now. It's one of the great challenges, which is why another reason we're interested in Mars, because we know those conditions were there. We know there were what's called hydrothermal vent systems on the floors of oceans on Mars 3.8 or 4 billion years ago. So it would be good to know if what I've said is right. 
And the, the way we find out is to find life or evidence of past life. Uh, are you aware of uh, the speculation that was going around? How, how recent was it, that Occupy thing, the, uh, the octopus eggs? They, there was a group of scientists that were speculating that it's, po you know, panspermia, the idea of panspermia, yeah, yeah. that it's possible that octopi had come from somewhere else. Some frozen eggs had actually come from somewhere else and, and landed on Earth. And these were like legitimate scientists who were contemplating, not morons. I, I don't think... Have you seen this? The, no, I didn't. But I mean, it, I think it's unlikely. So panspermia doesn't have to be unlikely. Right. I mean, for example, you sure. might have seen the other day we found an Earth rock on the moon. Yes. Right. Well, they, well it was back yeah. on Earth now because the Apollo right. astronauts brought it back, didn't they? And it's four billion years old or something well, like one that. One of the oldest rocks ever found. Yeah. Right. So, so we know that material gets transferred between planets. Um, and so it's not inconceivable that microbes could survive that journey. Right? We know that microbes can survive in space, for example. So... That isn't mad. Uh, it's, right. it's probably unlikely, but it's not mad. But with the octopus, I hadn't heard that. But the thing is that the octopus is still extremely similar biologically to us. I mean, the differences are negligible. Yeah. So it's still got the same energy system with the single ATP and DNA and all that stuff. It's all very, very similar. It was something about RNA and DNA. Did you, did you find that article? I'm, trying to, I'm looking at a different one from so a different I, website. It's about the same thing. It has to the, do with the Cambrian explosion. And th there were 33 authors on a paper that got published in the progress and in, in biophysics and molecular biology that talked about this possibility. There are other people that disagree with it, though. Right. I mean, I suppose the I haven't seen it, so I think it's unlikely because the octopus is extremely similar to us. So that suggests a common origin to me. That I suppose the counter argument you could you could advance would be there's only one way to do life. So you could say mm, that actually right. given – because the laws of physics and chemistry are the same everywhere. So maybe it's – maybe DNA is the only way to do it. So that's the way it gets done. Which so is you, why they're so similar to us, yeah, so although you, so alien as well. Yeah, they're, they're not though. You know, that's the thing about an octopus. That's why I'm surprised about it because they're not that alien. They're, they're very similar. Well, they're in their abilities. I mean, their ability to transform their out, outer texture and their color instant, almost instantaneously. Oh, yeah. I mean, they have incredible camouflage abilities that really don't exist yeah. in the, the mam mammalian world. Yeah, but on a cellular level, you look at an octopus cell in a, mm -hmm. under a microscope and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Right. Between an octopus cell and a human cell. So the only way that that would make sense is if all life comes from basically the same kind of building blocks and just varies depending upon the conditions and where it takes right. place. I'm I'm guessing, but right. yes, that 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 must be the uh, the only way you could sustain that, given that they're so similar to us because mm. they really are biochemically. Is that that's the only way it can be done, given the. Given the building block, the toolkit, the laws of nature and the, the elements and so on that we have in our universe. One day they're going to have an artificial body. There's going to be a company that's going to have an artificial body that works perfectly. And they can guarantee that they can take your brain out of that artificial body and put it in this, put it in this new perfect body. Take it out of yours, put that's it in like this. That's like the movie Surrogate. And they guarantee you you'll live longer. You get an extra 150 years with this Would artificial you do body. I'm, I'm a moron. I would definitely do it. <laughs> I'm de I'm would you want to live forever? No, not forever. But Me I would neither. never know when to end. That's Me the neither. thing. There's like a parable about that, about some guy who, uh, who lives the, the hundreds of years, but he has to kill his kids in order to do it. I think True Blood was kind of like that, too, that movie. When the motherfucker was the vampires, he got tired of living. He's like, all right, this shit boring. Well, that was in. Could uh, you imagine seeing people complain about the same things for hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of years? Plus, like, you got to kill people. Here they every go day. again. Here they go again, fighting for their rights. Here they go again, tired of this shit. Here they go again. Because like, you go through the same shit every 20 years. Yeah. You probably get tired of killing them, too. People that's 90 years old tired of hearing this shit. People 80 years old, you just oh yeah. You just laugh at the young people going through their shit. <laughs> Here they go. Here Did they you go. ever see an uh, interview with a vampire? I don't remember it. Is that Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt movie? That yeah, but I don't Kristen remember. Dunst. Should I watch it again? It's a great fucking movie. I got to watch it again. But the whole idea is that part of it is that this, these vampires have been around for hundreds of years, and they're, they're starting to get sick of it. Mm -hmm. They're kind of freaked out. Yeah, that's how True Blood was. They're tired of that yeah. shit. Makes sense. My grandma's mad she alive. Really? Yeah, my Grammy from Bahamas, she she be like, like she be depressing. Because like, like you got to think about it. When you that old... 
You the only one around. You ain't got nobody to talk to. Yeah. Nobody give a yeah. fuck. Yeah. Pe- your kids only come over there to take pics, photo ops. You know, nobody give a damn about them. Right. You know, so like, and this is a true story. She, she, she passed out in the garage and stayed there because she thought she was dead. And then she realized she wasn't. Got up and walked and went right back in the house. <laughs> wow. Like they just. Like so, they don't want you. Don't want to be here. You, that's why you want something. You would, even if you don't believe in God, you would want something after this. Like when you like, it got to be something after this shit. You, I want it to be. You would want to think something after this because this is this this is boring at the end. This don't end good. It doesn't end good. Shit. Some people think that for sure nothing happens, and that to me is just as dumb as thinking for sure something happens. Man, who either knows? Way, either way, I'd rather be I'd rather be right than wrong. <laughs> shit, shit. <laughs> I'd rather believe, and you're like, nah, you ain't believe. I said, I told you, I believe. <laughs> when you see a dead person, it seems like something's gone. I swear to God, when my be- when one of my best friends, a comedian that that passed, died, I re- that's when I was like, oh no, nah, this has got to be a god or something, because I saw it. Like it's you feel they're gone in that, yeah. When I was in the room with him, right on his deathbed, I saw it. Like, you could just see. And you could see that they see it. Because he really, like, at the time, he wanted me to, he asked me to play Smile Bitch for him. And I played it for him. And then after that, he tried to pull the thing out of his mouth. Right after that. And the funny thing about it, I didn't think it was like no, I didn't see it as no suicide thing. It was just like, you could see that he saw, all right, next level. I mean, next step. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, that I didn't let him do it because I didn't want to see it. I, was, I said no, no. Pulled him down and told his sister to come in. But it's just you really see it then when you're in there and you see life and see it where it ends. And and you know it's not a bad thing. You just see like this is this is what it is. Yeah, this is what it is. Yeah, it comes and goes. Comes and goes. I mean, it's some some next. I hope. Shit. You know what someone said once and. Uh, one of the um, one of the Gracie fathers talked about this too. Said he believed and he lived his life. Uh, Elio Gracie lived his life like you have to get everything perfect. You have to do everything the right way, or you come back and you do it all over again. Yeah, that's how um, karma. That's how people in Indonesia think, and there's no crime over there. None. Where I was at in um, Bali. Well, it's a great way to think. It's, if it's perfect right, way to think. And if it's right, I mean, maybe that's because think you about are. even if even if it ain't right, you should think that way. Because yeah. if you thought that way, if you thought you come back looking like an ant, you ain't finna be doing too much crazy shit. You gonna do right. You gonna do right by people. Yeah, in the best way you can. Well, that always makes me think like someone like you. Like, how many times have you done this ride? You know what I mean? Like maybe hmm. some people are just maybe the dumbest maybe people amongst us are just they're just new on the ride. That's They've what you know what three that's, or four times. <laughs> that's the best way to articulate it because it's like to me my whole life feel like this shit is so simple, but to everybody else, it's so complicated. Yeah, like maybe you've been on the ride a lot. Maybe you've been on this ride like a thousand times. That's crazy. I I say this many times and I'll say it some more. Give me that lighter. You got Look, it, Fred. Alex Jones, he's he's made some mistakes and some big ones, but he's also actually exposed some real shit, and he owns up to the mistakes he's made. They're not good. He doesn't think they're good. The, there's a thing about finding conspiracies everywhere that's not good for your brain. I really believe this. I think that if you go looking for those things and that's all you look for and you look for them all the time, you can get real paranoid and real crazy. And then uh, there's also a bunch of people that are trying to stop you from doing that because you do expose some crazy shit. Yeah. You know, he was talking about Epstein a long time ago. I know. A long time ago. He was saying there is a fucking island and, the, and they take all these rich politicians and, and some celebrities and they bang these kids. And I was like, come on. He was telling me this a long time ago. So he's also the one who told me about Bohemian Grove. Well, I actually watched it. For, that's, I think this tape was actually made before I met him. So he went and snuck in to this place where like former presidents go. There's yeah. a photograph of it's uh, Ronald Reagan with Herbert Walker Bush and a couple other people all standing around. 
And it's like, these are the people that used to hang out at this place and they would put on robes and they would worship an owl god, an owl god and they would burn an effigy. And they're playing, and, and Alex snuck in and made video footage of this shit. And no one's denying that it's real. This really did happen. They're, so they're in with these bankers and former presidents and they're dressed like druids. And, yes. they, and some guy brings over something that it's an effigy that's supposed to be a body, a wrapped up effigy. It's also a bunch of sticks in, bl in a blanket, but it's like shaped like a body. Yeah. And then they drop it on the fire and they're all worshiping an owl god. Why is that bad? Uh, imagine if you saw those, if that's what your business is, just finding those things. How crazy do you think you get? First of all, wait. Then you add in vodka and head wounds. Wait, 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 hold on, wait. Go to the vodka and head wounds part. What it's do you Alex mean? Jones. Okay, I got you. A lot of Look, vodka and he had a bad Look, head injury. God younger. damn it, man. When I was in liberal arts school, man, there was this great teacher who changed my life, Sam Scoville. And he, he, one of the things he taught was so beautiful. He still teaches there. One of the things he taught was figure out a way to take in all information and then filter out the shit that's not real and yes. keep the real stuff. And like, you know, Alex Jones is like, let's, yeah. It, I, Some I, of the stuff is real. Take what's real and there's throw a, out the rest. There's a good chunk of it yeah. that's real. Like, I remember he was telling me that, that there's governments using chemicals that are turning frogs gay. I was like, what? What are you talking about? He goes, yes. He goes, pesticides are turning frogs gay. And I'm like, that can't be real. No, there really is. Is that true? Yes, there's pesticides that change frogs' genders. What? Yes. Yes. But ch some pesticide fucks with frogs' genders. That sucks. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, depends on the frog. Maybe it's awesome for the frog. Depends Maybe on frogs the frog. don't give a fuck because they've never been taught homophobia. Why would they, they care? They don't care who they fuck. Uh, but, yeah. But who? there's a real thing that... Let's see if you can find that. It's... It's a pesticide that has some sort of an effect, an unintended effect on frogs' genders. Dude, that's another thing that people don't talk about. Pesticides that have been used in, like, golf courses and, like, there's people who live around those. That's a chemical dump. Yeah, golf courses are Pesticide fucked up. atrazine can turn male frogs into Whoa. females. Cool. <laughs> so, so this is a fucking pesticide Berkeley that News. changes the gender, or should I say the sex? Is it the same thing? I have to talk, sex and gender. Hey, I'm not getting sucked into that fucking black hole, Rogan. You can keep that shit to yourself. But hey, I'll get sucked into another black hole. Isn't hey, that crazy, though? Well, yeah. Okay, that, before else? we get into the, that, that stuff, I want to say this real quick. Okay. Is that camera on me? Friends at the Bohemian Grove. Future <laughs> friends, I should say. I just want you to know. I don't know much about you. I know Alex Jones, you know, probably on vodka drinks. I don't think he was then. I think he was sober. You started drinking after all this. Please don't fuck this up. For sorry, me. sorry. So you had an infiltrator. Look, I went to a summer camp. <laughs> we had bonfires. We wore robes. I mean, not like maybe what you do. I just want to say, hey, come on. Invite me, please. <laughs> I won't tell anybody anything. I've heard you guys are pretty awesome. Actually, what I've heard is the idea was to get a bunch of hardcore neocons together and then mix some artists in in the hopes that, like, Having like brushing shoulders with artists would in some way, shape, or form loosen some people up a little bit. <laughs> and I've also heard you have a tram that connects campsites there to other campsites, meaning you just get in the tram and suddenly you're hanging out with Dick Cheney. Listen, I won't tell anybody. I got a podcast. I won't even tell Joe. Let me in. I'll worship Moloch. 